Hello, in this example problem, we'll explore the use of load combinations to determine the maximum bending moment and shear force that would be considered in the evaluation or design of a beam. The LRFD load combinations from the 2016 edition of the ASCE 7 standard will be applied to a simply supported beam under two different loading cases. For this problem, we are asked to find the critical factor design moment and shear force for the beam shown. It's a simply supported beam with a span length of 30 feet subjected to a dead load consisting of a uniformly distributed load of 725 pounds per linear foot and a live load consisting of two point loads applied at the third points of the beam, each with a magnitude of 12 kips. Let's get started. As a point of reference, this slide shows the different permutations of the LRFD load combinations from the 2016 ASCE 7 standard that we have been considering for most of our problems. And for a problem like this, where all we have are dead loads and live loads, only two of these permutations are needed. That being said, I'll start off by noting that there are two different approaches that we can use to solve this problem. Using what I'll call approach number one, you can first factor the loads that are applied to the beam and then calculate the critical bending moments and shear forces resulting from those factored loads using the two load combinations. Alternatively, using what I'll call approach number two, you can first find the critical bending moments and shear forces for each of the two service cases and then apply the load combinations to factor those service level moments and shear forces. I'll solve the problem both ways so that you can see how both of these approaches are implemented. Using approach number one, we'll start off by applying the load factors from load combination number one. Since load combination number one includes only dead load, the resulting factored loads applied to the beam consist only of a uniformly distributed load with a magnitude of 1,015 pounds per linear foot. From this loading, we can sketch the shear force and bending moment diagrams and under these loads, we can see that the maximum shear force occurs at each end of the beam with a magnitude of 15.2 kips, and that the maximum bending moment occurs at mid-span with a magnitude of 114 kip feet. Still using approach number one, we'll now apply the load factors that are included in load combination number two. The resulting factor dead load has a magnitude of 870 pounds per linear foot, and the factored live loads each have a magnitude of 19.2 kips. Note that I use a subscript U for ultimate to indicate that these loads have been factored. From this loading, we can again sketch the shear force and the bending moment diagrams. And under these loads, we can see that we have a maximum shear force still occurring at each end of the beam with a magnitude of 32.3 kips and a maximum bending moment occurring at mid-span with a magnitude of 290 kip feet. As an alternative to drawing shear force and bending moment diagrams, we also have other options for performing our beam analysis. On this slide, I'm showing a couple of pages from the AISC Manual of Steel Construction that include beam tables where shear forces, bending moments, and deflections are provided for many commonly encountered beam configurations and loadings. If we look at case one, we can see that it applies to the case of a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. From this, we can see that the maximum shear force occurs at each end of the beam and has a magnitude of WL over 2, and that the maximum bending moment occurs at mid-span and has a magnitude of WL squared over 8. Case 9 applies to a simply supported beam subjected to two evenly spaced point loads. From this, we can see that the maximum shear force occurs at each end of the beam and has a magnitude of P and that the maximum bending moment occurs in between the two point loads and has a magnitude equal to P times A, where A is the distance between the support and the point where the point load is applied. Considering the factored loading from load combination number two, we can apply the equations from the AISC beam tables to determine the maximum factored shear, V sub U, and the maximum factored bending moment, M sub U. Note that the values that I calculated here using the equations match the values that we determined by drawing shear force and bending moment diagrams. 
Now let's solve the problem again using approach number two. Using this approach, we first do our beam analysis to determine the service level shear forces and bending moments, and then apply the factors from our load combinations to these forces and bending moments. I'll start off by sketching the shear force and the bending moment diagrams resulting from the service dead load, and then the shear force and bending moment diagrams resulting from the service live load. Next, I'll rearrange these diagrams so that I have both the shear force diagrams on the left and both of the bending moment diagrams on the right. Now we can evaluate the load combinations using the service level shears at the left end of the beam, first by applying load combination number one and then by applying load combination number two. As before, you can see that load combination number two governs and we end up with a factored shear force V sub U equal to 32.3 kips. Finally, we can evaluate the load combinations for the bending moments, first by applying load combination number one, and then by applying load combination number two. As before, you can see that the load combination number two results in the critical value of M sub U with a factored bending moment of 290 kip feet. Note that when we apply the load combinations, we have to apply them to magnitudes of shear force or bending moments at common locations along the beam for both the service dead and the service live. It wouldn't be appropriate to mix the load combinations up with a shear force from the dead load diagram at the end of the beam with a shear force from the live load diagram at a different location. Now let's take a look at a slightly different version of the same problem. In this case, instead of having a pair of point loads located at the third points, we'll consider the case where only one point load is applied at the second third point of the beam. Again, I'll consider both approaches to the solution of the problem. Using approach number one and considering load combination number one, you can see that the factored load that is applied to the beam is the same as it was in the original problem. And since the factored load consists of only the dead load, there is really no change to the resulting factored shear force or bending moment relative to the original version of the problem. Still using approach number one, but now considering load combination number two, the applied loading consists of a uniformly distributed load of 870 pounds per linear foot and a single point load with a magnitude of 19.2 kips. The shear force and bending moment diagrams resulting from this loading can be sketched as is shown here, and we can observe that the maximum shear force occurs at the right end with a magnitude of 25.9 kips, and that the maximum bending moment occurs under the point load with a magnitude of 215 kip feet. Note that I report the absolute value of the maximum shear force on the beam, since in most cases the sign of the shear force doesn't matter. Like before, we can perform our beam analysis using the beam tables instead of drawing shear force and bending moment diagrams. Case one still applies for the uniformly distributed dead load where the maximum shear force is WL over two and the maximum bending moment is WL squared over eight. Case eight applies to the case of a simply supported beam with a single off-center point load. As you can see here, the maximum shear force occurs at the right end of the beam when the load is located to the right of mid-span and has a magnitude of PA over L, where A is the distance between the left support and the point where the load is applied. You can also see that the maximum moment occurs under the point load and has a magnitude equal to PAB over L. Considering the factored loading from load combination number two, we can again apply the equations from the AISC beam tables to determine the maximum factored shear, V sub U, and the maximum factored bending moment, M sub U. Note that the values that I calculated here using the equations again match the values that we determined by drawing shear force and bending moment diagrams. Now let's solve the problem again using approach number two. We'll start off by sketching shear force and bending moment diagrams resulting from the service dead load and then from the service live loads. Next, I'll rearrange these diagrams so that we have both of the shear force diagrams on the left and both of the bending moment diagrams on the right. 
Now we can evaluate the load combinations using the service level shears and moments. I'll consider only load combination number two this time. At the left end of the beam, we end up with a factored shear force V sub U equal to 19.5 kips. But at the right end of the beam, we end up with a factored shear force V sub U of 25.9 kips. Finally, we can evaluate the bending moments, but first we observe that the maximum dead load moment occurs at a different location on the beam than the maximum live load moment. If we first evaluate the load combination at mid-span, we have to calculate the live load moment at that location. Since the bending moment diagram is linear, we can use similar triangles to determine that the mid-span live load moment is 60 kip feet. Then we can evaluate load combination number two at that location and find that M sub U is equal to 194 kip feet. At last, we can consider the bending moments under the point load, first by determining the dead load moment at that location and then by applying the load factors from the load combination. We again determine that the factored moment M sub U is equal to 215 kip feet at the point where the point load is applied. Okay, that wraps up this problem. In this example, we explored two different approaches to applying load combinations using two different methods of beam analysis, and we ended up with the same results in all cases. Note, however, that when we get into more sophisticated analyses, specifically second order analyses where equilibrium of the structure is based on the deformed geometry instead of on the original geometry, that we have to factor the loads before we perform the analysis. But that's probably quite a ways away for most of you. Anyways, thanks a lot.